Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I am your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to our generous underwriters on Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Thursday, January 12th, we are studying John chapter 1, verses 35 to 42. As John continues to proclaim Jesus as the Lamb of God, Jesus begins to call his first disciples. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor David Appold. Pastor Appold serves at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Paducah, Kentucky. Pastor Appold, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Yes, hello. Good to be with you, Tim. As we get started this morning, Pastor, help us with some context. What should we know about John, his gospel, and chapter 1 in particular as we look at today's text? Yeah, uh, this is, we're at the beginning of uh, Jesus' public ministry, almost the exact beginning, actually. Um, there's in, in John's gospel, uh, the, the, there's no Christmas story per se, right? The birth of Jesus is, um, is not narrated in the way that it is in, say, Luke or in Matthew. Um, so it's more like Mark in this way, where you kind of just get right into the action. Um, of course, that being said, John does have the beautiful um, prologue, uh, is what it's sometimes called, you know, that opening, um, the great eight, it's 18 verses. If our hearers uh, were in church on Christmas morning, I'm sure they heard it read out, the word became flesh. Uh, but what we're going to get into here is uh, Jesus is kind of fresh off of his baptism, and now uh, he begins to get his disciples. And, uh, um, you know, the calling of the disciples in John's gospel is quite different, or you get a different perspective on it anyways. Uh, maybe it fills out the picture um, from what we usually hear in the synoptics, where Jesus is the one calling them. Uh, what mm -hmm. we're going to hear today is that um, the disciples get sent to Jesus through John the Baptist. Mm. All right, so let's just go ahead and jump right into this text. This is John chapter 1, verses 35 to 42. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon, the son of John? You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. That's our text for today. That's John chapter 1, verses 35 to 42. So, Pastor Appled, one of the things, especially when you compare this to the Synoptic Gospels, uh, it's a little bit different, is that after Jesus is baptized in the Synoptic Gospels, John pretty well recedes into the background in terms of the narrative. He shows up again in prison, and then you get the account of his beheading in the Synoptic Gospels. But here in John, John the Baptist continues to play a role what what's John doing still preaching? Yeah, it's um, you know if you just if we just had the synoptics, I think you wouldn't you wouldn't get this sense of an overlap, uh, which comes out in John in John's gospel, uh, John the Apostle John. This is going to be an interesting episode. That's right, because we're going to be talking about John. Uh, but the there does there is a time overlap, a chronological overlap between the ministry of John the Baptist and the ministry of Jesus, and so. Um, what John shows us is that what John's gospel here shows us is that um, there is a time uh, during which both of these men are active in their preaching, the forerunner and the Christ. Uh, and for, for whatever reason, uh, John is still in some ways amassing disciples, but he's also in this 
um, transitional stage where he's also directing them to Jesus. Um, so he doesn't simply baptize and then say, all right, I fulfilled my ministry. I'm ready to retire. I'm going to call it quits. He keeps preaching and people keep coming out to him. And then through that, um, you know, through the, the witness of John the Baptist, disciples are continue to be brought to Jesus without Jesus, you know, in a, in a sense, without Jesus having to do all the work himself, John keeps um, cycle, funneling people towards Jesus. So, so John continues in his role as the, the forerunner of the Christ and as the preparer of the way for, for Christ to come, even after Christ has come. And so we, I mean, we get that sense here. It is, and I, this is, I don't know, there's any way for us to answer this question, but you maybe you wonder, like, why didn't John the Baptist become one of Jesus' disciples? Or why didn't he just, like, you know, stop preaching and, and just tell people, no, I'm not preaching anymore because you need to go listen to that guy. I mean, it's, I guess with, you know, he kind of, he, he functions in a way where he's got, the way I've heard it put is he's got one foot in the Old Testament and one in the New. And maybe his role of continuing to preach while Jesus is there is that Old Testament function of prophet it continuing, still proclaiming the word, all the while pointing to the word made flesh, Jesus over there. And, and we see that, you know, go follow that guy. Yeah, I think that's right on. Seeing John as sort of the, you know, in a, in a way, all of the Old Testament is sort of wrapped up in John. And you even get this, I think, especially when you read about the, the nativity of John the Baptist, where um, it's, mm-hmm. At the beginning of Luke's gospel, it's like um, all of the Old Testament is happening all over again. You know, there's a priest in the temple and he's offering the incense, but then his son is also going to be a Nazarite. um, And there's this elderly couple who are barren, but they're going to have a child of promise. You know, it's like I've heard this story before. Um, I've heard that story before. And all these things are happening in a way anew. They're happening afresh. And so then when Jesus comes on the scene, um, he doesn't obliterate the Old Testament. It's not like we say, well, we have no need for this anymore. Um, But the Old Testament and in the person of John the Baptist, you can see this especially. The Old Testament now continues, but it continues with a a clear goal. You know, Mm. here's the finish line. Um, We've always been looking for the Christ and now here he is. And so we continue, the Old Testament continues to prophesy of him or to witness to him. But now it says, finally, at last, here's the Christ. Mm. And so John continues in that Old Testament role of prophesying of the Christ all the way up until his death. And even even there, he serves as the preparer of the way, the forerunner of Christ, even in his death. And he continues to do that all the way up as that, basically as that last Old Testament preacher. He doesn't just stop that Old Testament preaching. Once Jesus is there, he continues to point to him. And I think that maybe the, the point we should make clear here is that he's not a rival preacher to Jesus in this sense. He's not, as you said, you know, he still has disciples. And in fact, in that Advent text from Matthew 11, where where, Jesus, where John from prison sends those disciples to Jesus, even at that point, he still has disciples. But you never get the impression that yeah. he's doing so as a rival preacher to Jesus, always working toward pointing people that way. Yeah, and I mean, this This also, you know, when we stand, you know, in the year 2022, 2023, looking back on, you know, the, the entrance of the New Testament, um, it's easy for us to, to think of these things as kind of cut and dry, like, okay, John's ministry lasted for, you know, two years, six months, and three weeks. And then Jesus was on the scene and he, you know, the whole kingdom came in all at once, but uh, it didn't actually work that mm-hmm. way, right? There there was overlaps. And that actually is consistent with the way um, God had advanced Old Testament history too, um, is that the, you know, when it was time for um, the tabernacle to give way to the temple, um, it didn't happen all of a sudden, right? There was a there was a time of preparation. Um, there was a time of announcement, and then there was the time of actually bringing it in. Um, and so, when we're reading John one, of course, we read it after the resurrection, after Pentecost. Uh, but those things hadn't happened yet. Uh, and so the the ministry of John the Baptist and the ministry of Jesus overlapping. Well, it makes sense. This is how um, this is how God God's kingdom has always 
advanced. It comes in stages and it doesn't come all at once. Now, there will be definitive moments, cross, resurrection, Pentecost, uh, but there's also the um, the preparation for that, the anticipation, and that's what we're reading about today. Mm. Well, and, and even just to see John preaching while Jesus is has been baptized and he's already been made known now to Israel, that you you see in that the way that God has worked in in the Old Testament and continues to work, that that the Lord still desires to send men as preachers to proclaim His word. You know, even even Jesus in His earthly ministry sends out His disciples to proclaim repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Even when He's right there doing that very same thing, and so John continues as that preacher, just as there continue to be preachers now that proclaim the word of of Christ. That that doesn't change with the coming of Jesus. It's still that that preached word that he uses. Yeah, and I, th- I think the seeing John, again, we've already mentioned this, but seeing John as, um, you know, the summary figure of the whole Old Testament, um, it's like Jesus said, um, among those born of women, none are greater than John the Baptist, right? He's the ultimate prophet, um, and he's greater than those who came before him, not because he uh, necessarily said better words. I mean, I don't know who your favorite prophet is, Tim, but it's hard to be. <laughs> well, it's hard, it's to, hard to beat Isaiah, right? Yeah, it's hard right. to beat, uh, you know. Uh, but John is closer to Jesus, and John is seen. I think when Jesus says none are greater than John, in a sense, he's saying none had the um, the fulfillment of the things that they hoped for the way that John does. Yeah. And so John stands right on the precipice of the New Testament, um, and he shows us here's how the Old Testament is going to continue to function. Right. As Christians, we don't say, well, that's old stuff. We don't need it anymore. Uh, But all of these things, um, like it says in the prologue of John's gospel here, you know, John came as one who bore witness about the light. He himself was not the light, but he bore witness about the light. And uh, he that is what the Old Testament continues to do for us. Why do we pay any attention to that stuff anymore? Mm -hmm. Well, because it all um, shows us. Christ. It directs us to Jesus Christ. Mm. I mean, you can see that even in the text that we have today, and we'll, we'll get there, but, you know, in the way that, that Andrew introduces Jesus to his brother, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. I mean, he they've been reading the Old Testament. They know that it's pointing to this Christ, this Messiah, and they recognize that in Jesus it has come. So for us still today, the Old Testament does that same thing, and that's how we read the Old Testament. So John is still fulfilling this role pointing to Christ and he's going to, we're going to see him a few more times here in this gospel. But, but as he says, he, he's going to start to fade into the background because the fulfillment is here in Christ. Yeah. The, uh, maybe his famous words, uh, you know, this, again, you don't get this in, in the synoptics. It's, this is a John thing, uh, John, the God, John's gospel thing. Um, in chapter three, um, there's this great statement by John the Baptist, he must increase, I must decrease, right? So, um, and then I think in chapter five, Jesus talks about, you know, John was a light burning, and for a while you rejoiced in that light, but now I am I am come as the true light. Mm-hmm. Um, and so John fades into the background, he, and he fades without simply um, being obliterated or, or disappearing. He still burns, he's still a light shining, and he's pointing his disciples to Jesus, but he's also still gathering disciples. He's also still continuing to say, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. His baptism goes on until, um, you know, a better baptism can take its place. Uh, that's the way that the Old Testament kind of always went, uh, was that these things endured, they were good for a while, they served their purpose, and when their time was up, God, you know, took care of that too and made sure that the the old things pass away so that what is new can replace it. Mm. So John is continuing that role of preaching of Jesus, and and he does so with words that we heard in yesterday's text. He says, it's recorded in a a shorter form here, behold the Lamb of God. Uh, We talked about this yesterday, but it's one of my favorite sermons from John, probably my favorite sermon from John. Talk a little bit about, about what John is preaching there. Yeah, we like this as preachers because it shows it gives us license to preach the same sermon every day. That's right. right. That's right. Um, <laughs> Look, John did change. it. You're right. And in fact, you can even preach shorter every day. That's right. Um, because you know they already heard it the day before. But repetition is the mother of all learning, too. And so, um, John, you, you get this sense. Okay, 
before the baptism of Jesus, he was always talking about the one who comes after me, the one who comes after me, the one who comes after me. And now that one has appeared. And so now he can say, behold, here he is. Behold, here he is. And it's interesting, too, isn't it, that Jesus is walking around there. You know, um, the Greek word is this great word that maybe our listeners have heard before. It's peripateo, right? Uh, a peripatetic teacher is one who walks about mm -hmm. and his disciples just follow him around. The Greeks, um, that was kind of the Greek way of teaching and perhaps also maybe the rabbinic the, you know, the early Jewish way, too, uh, was that you didn't set up a classroom, right? You didn't have people come to a lecture hall, but you you walked about and your students would follow you. So here's Jesus walking around following maybe John, right? He's mm. he's coming back the next day um, or, or the next week after the baptism. We don't have in John's gospel the same um, Jesus going out into the wilderness. So did this happen before he went into the wilderness or is this after the wilderness? Not entirely sure. Uh, but in, for whatever reason, Jesus comes back and he's hanging around John and his disciples for a reason, right? So that John's disciples can be funneled to Jesus. Mm. Okay, so, so John preaches again, behold the Lamb of God, a second sermon, shorter sermon, and two of the disciples hear it and they I guess they they get it. They follow Jesus. Now you you mentioned earlier that this is this is different than the way we hear in the synoptic gospels of Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee and saying follow me. Here you've got John being the impetus, behold the lamb of God and they follow Jesus. Talk a little bit about the the call of the disciples and the way that it's it's being recorded here in John 1. Yeah, I think uh, I I hope I'm not alone in this. I've I've often wondered you know, um, if you're if you're only reading Matthew or Mark or Luke and you get the sense that, you know, Andrew and Peter are out there fishing. Simon, I guess be, his name hasn't been changed yet. And James and John are out on the Sea of Galilee fishing. And Jesus just says, follow me. And they just go. Right. I mean, that's how it comes across in the synoptics. And I think there, you know, it's not just how it comes across. There was something incredibly dynamic or magnetic about our Lord when he commands something, when he says, come, follow me. These men, right, these hardworking men leave everything. And the, OK, he, I'm going to follow that guy. Right. Uh, but here in John, you, you get the picture filled out a little more, which is that they weren't total strangers to Jesus. Right. They, they so. After this, in John's gospel, there must have been some time where Andrew and Peter and James and John um, weren't necessarily staying with Jesus all the time. And so they go up to Capernaum, to Galilee. They're, they're fishing on the water with their fathers. And it's not until later that Jesus is going to you know, say, all right, something totally new now, right? Uh, but here in John 1, you get that initial before they were called off the waters, they were directed to Jesus and they got to know him a little bit anyways. They knew something about him. And what they know about him is this great title that John mm. gives him. He's the Lamb of God. Mm. So with let's just talk about this real quick, at least. The, the two disciples of John heard him proclaim, Behold the Lamb of God. Now, we know from verse 40 that one of those two is Andrew. As far as I can see, the other one isn't named here. So does that mean we're probably talking about John, the apostle, the author of this gospel, is the other unnamed disciple in this case? That's who I take it as. I mean, it's possible that it's just, uh, I mean, it could be anyone, right? It could be any <laughs> other disciple. But in John's gospel, this happens um, fairly, I don't know if I'd say regularly, but it happens quite often where you have two disciples mentioned, but only one is named. Um, and there's oh, there's this unnamed disciple throughout John's gospel. Um, later then, too, I think this links up with the whole there's a disciple, there's this disciple who Jesus loved. Mm -hmm. And that is sort of the the author, John, the apostle John's, um, you know, it's his way of including. It's not just his way of including himself. Right. He's not putting himself where he he wasn't, in fact, but he doesn't have to say Andrew and I were there doing it, right? He can say, he can write about himself without using the pronoun I, me, without, you know, doing that. Mm. All right. So two disciples, Andrew for sure, and likely John, hear the Baptist proclamation, behold the Lamb of God, and they then follow Jesus. 
Jesus <laughs> turns, he sees them, and he says to them, what are you seeking? And and these are actually in the gospel, according to John, these are the first words that we hear Jesus speak, what are you seeking? Which I've always found significant, that that this is the very first thing that that Jesus would say. Let, let's, let's talk, I mean, he asks a question. Let's talk about what Jesus yeah. asked them. Yeah, abs- I think you're right on to, to get that sense of um, there's something, you know, that's that reaches out beyond just the question to Andrew and, you know, this other disciple in Jesus's words. And, and just to kind of reinforce that point, think, compare that with the first things that we hear Jesus saying in the other Gospels, hmm. right? In Mark's Gospel, I think the very first thing Jesus says is, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. You know, um, so you get this Jesus, the preacher there in, um, I suppose in Luke, you have some of the earlier thing, you know, the early life of Christ. And so I don't know exactly what the first thing Jesus says. in Luke. Is it? I think it's his it, words as a 12 year old. Yeah. Are, oh, perfect. Did you not know I must be about my father's business? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, this is great, Tim. I hadn't thought about that. But in John's gospel, we'll come back to John here. That initial statement of Jesus kind of is going to open up uh, a, a trajectory for the rest of his ministry. Um, and so here come these disciples. What are you seeking? Right. Well, duh, Jesus. Right. Isn't the <laughs> answer obvious? But this is great for teachers, for pastors um, and for every Christian right there. When people are brought to Jesus, when they're brought to the church, then, too, um, this is an important sort of first step of saying, what are you here for? What are you looking for? What are you what are you expecting? And, uh, you know, I think Jesus is asking this and, and he he wants to set their expectations in the proper way. And we can talk about how they answer here. But there's a lot going on more than just Jesus is not simply interested in gathering information. Right. Mm. What are you looking for? Right. So this is this is a question then uh, I think though you said it extends beyond just the question to Andrew and to John, but then as the reader of the gospel, what are you seeking? And and we've had I mean John the apostle has already given us a clue as to what we should be seeking and what we're going to find here from Jesus. But but this question what are you seeking? I, I think it's a very applicable one for us still today. And I I'm, I'm sure you've had conversations with visitors at your church or, or ones who want to yeah. find out more and, and maybe want to join and you know why why do you want to join this church? What are you looking for? Is it is it what you know, for Jesus' question, is it what he's actually here to bring for the church today? Is that what that church is there to to give, is what you're seeking? And to have the expectation correct up at the front is, is very important, because and we'll see this play out later in John when people come to Jesus, say, thinking, hey, this guy can provide me meals for the rest of my life. They end up disappointed yeah. when they find out more things about Jesus. Yeah, people, I mean, we all know this, and, and we all have our own um, experiences, too. Um, people come to, to Jesus, they come to the church for all kinds of reasons. And it's good to actually, it's good for the, the teacher and also for the student, for the, you know, the would-be disciple, to take a little bit of time and say, what am I really looking for? Mm. What what am I after here? Um, so maybe this is this is good for us, Tim, we, sh- we should teach our, um, you know, our members and our ushers at our churches, make this your question when people <laughs> come in, you know, what are you, what are you doing here? You know, so welcoming. As, yeah, it can come across as kind of um, off-putting, but of course, that's not, the, the whole point is just the opposite, right? By asking the question, Jesus is kind of, um, he's getting them to express, he's getting them to say out loud, for their own sake, probably more so than for his sake, what am I after? What am I looking for? And I think that that's, that's an important thing for, uh, for us today, too, for modern Christians and would-be Christians, too, to say, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of things about the church, and, um, you know, it could be that my friend just invited me. I don't really know what I'm looking for. Um, you know, you tell me, Pastor, what sh- why should I be here? Um, but it's good for people to to really think that through because what you expect and what you're, what you're hoping for um, is not always going to match up with what Jesus offers. Right. And sometimes that's, that can be disappointing for people, but also it's um, 
you know, that's part of the learning process. That's the clarification that comes in the life of a disciple. Yeah, I mean, we will see in John's Gospel, John chapter 6 is one occasion, John chapter 8 is another one that comes to my mind, where where people are disappointed in what they're getting from Jesus, and so they walk away. You know, I mean, and so that that's a that's the reality. One of the things about this question, too, and I think, you know, when, when you said, I, I'm trying to imagine the, the ushers asking people as they're handing out the bulletin, what are you looking for? What are you doing here? You know, yeah. that, that's, but, but having, I mean, having that question, at least in our minds, is, is one, as a reminder that, that we are here because our Lord Jesus Christ has the truth. He is the truth. And, and yeah. we're here because of what he has to offer. And it lets him set the terms rather than, than us setting the terms. And I, I think that's important too. He's not, you know, he's not asking the question here so that he can adapt himself to whatever Andrew and John want, but rather as a way of reflecting or helping them to reflect on whether or not their desires are really what he's going to give. You know, he's setting yeah. the tone. Yeah, that's great. Who sets the agenda, right? There, there's been this idea, um, and it, I don't know if it's still popular or how popular it ever was, but the idea that you, you want to be seeker sensitive, right? Um, that's kind of the buzzword. Um, and I, I think sadly what often happens in a, a, if you have a seeker sensitive mindset is you let um, someone else set the agenda other than Jesus, and what you see here, um, Jesus wants to set the agenda, but he also wants his disciples to work through, um, you know, what am I after? What am I looking for? What? And that that's where that word seeking, right? It's not just like, hey, guys, what's up? You know, um, what are you seeking? There's something more. Uh, there's something deeper about seeking, searching, ac- you know, I'm I'm looking intently for something rather than. I just sort of stumbled upon Jesus, um, and that's that's really what John the Baptist is doing. He is he is gearing that seeking, that searching, that desiring for the Christ, and now he's saying, "Look, there he is, right there. Go talk to him. Go mm-hmm. ask him." Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I, I I know that you've taught new member classes probably many times in your life, Tim, um, but that's really part of the value of that new member experience is that. Our, our expectations, our hopes, our desires can be clarified. Um, and it's not just valuable for new members. Sometimes it's also really helpful for, you know, lifelong Lutherans, lifelong Christians to be asked, what am I seeking? Yeah. Um, so I, I think our synod has put out some good resources on um, like communion, right? Um, what we seek, knowing what we seek and why we come. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's I've used this question sometimes with, um, you know, before service, you've got visitors and you've got members alike, and you're and you're trying to figure out, you know, who's who and who's going to commune, and um, you know, just how do I help people walk through that whole, you know, closed communion, um, you know, all those things that go along with that. And I, I found that a helpful question to ask. Um, you know, sometimes if time is short, all you have time for is where are you a member? Where do you, are you a Lutheran? Um, but if you do have a little more time, it can, it can catch people off guard, um, to ask them, why are you, why would you like to commune with us? What, mm-hmm. what are you seeking? Um, I know sometimes I've asked that and, and, uh, there was one, a young man who responded, ah, uh, you know, I caught him totally off guard yeah. and he didn't know. And, and he said, ah, uh, my family, you know, he was stuttering. He, he thought I was like grilling him. And, you know, I was expecting the right answer, um, which, of course, I wanted him to come to the right answer. But I also asked it just to get him thinking about something other than um, what page are we on in the bulletin? Um, you know, those kind of questions. You want people to say, why Why do I come to church? What am I seeking? Mm. What does Jesus offer? His body, and you know, especially in the sacrament, his body and blood for the forgiveness of my sins. Oh, that's what I want. You know, yeah. that's what I'm seeking. Yeah, that's right. And and so in asking this question, Jesus does invite these two men to, to reflect on it, but also is going to lead them toward the right answer, which the Gospel of John will also give to us. We're going to take our break here on Sharper Iron. You're listening to Pastor David Apple this morning. Help us with John chapter one. We'll be right back. Please stick around.
Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. What do you think of when you hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable. A college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran. A college that won't take a dime of federal funding. A college that teaches the best of our Western heritage. A college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College. A college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org. Subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Thursday, January 12th. We're studying John chapter 1, verses 35 to 42 with Pastor David Appold. He serves at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Paducah, Kentucky. Pastor Appold, prior to the break, we were talking about the question that Jesus asks, what are you seeking? His first words here in the Gospel of John, a question for Andrew and John who are there before him, but also to all who would read this Gospel, who would come to Christ, what are you looking for? And this is not a question that Jesus intends as an intimidation factor or anything like that, but rather to invite us to reflect on what we seek and then to help us to come to the true answer of what he comes to bring. These two men respond, Andrew and John, by saying, Rabbi, which means teacher, John clarifies that, where are you staying? Now, you you mentioned earlier that conversation you had with, with someone about close communion and the kind of catching off guard. I've always kind of wondered if if Andrew and John maybe stammered a little bit, if they were caught off guard by Jesus' question. You're like, yeah. well, uh, where are you staying? But I, I do think there it's more, at least in the way that it's recorded by John, there's more than just this was the first thing that they could think to to ask, that when they call Jesus rabbi, and then John takes the time to actually tell us what that means, and they ask him where he's staying, that both of those things are important for us as, as readers of the gospel. Yeah. Yeah, The um, throughout, especially the first chapter of John, but uh, really all through the gospel of John, the tit- it's, it's always helpful to pay attention to the titles that are being used. So, the listeners are probably familiar with the I am statements. You know, Jesus gives himself or he um, takes to himself these titles. I am the good shepherd. I am the light. I am, or I am the way and the truth and the life, um, those kind of things. But also uh, his, dis- his disciples here assign titles to him as well. Right. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Andrew here calls him a rabbi, and that sets up a, uh, an implicit kind of relationship. So they want him to be their teacher, and he wants to take them as his students. Hmm. Okay, so so rabbi, teacher, and then that he wants to take them as his students. They want to be his students. Then they ask, "Where are you staying?" Again, that that seems like well, I don't know what else to say, but maybe there's there's more there. Yeah. The, so the answer, um, you know, the, what could they have said to him? We are seeking. Um, we are seeking the Christ or we're just here because John said to follow you, <laughs> right? Uh, but they want to know, where are you staying? And that word throughout John's gospel, again, I think you're right on, Tim, to sense that this whole dialogue is is open is going to open up into the rest of the gospels. Um, so the, the question, where are you staying? Um, if we use older language, sometimes it can sound more profound, but it can also help link up with other parts of um, of the Gospel of John. So um, the word there could also be translated abiding. Where are you abiding? And the reason I like to, to translate it that way is because that will call to mind some of the words that Jesus will say later. If you abide in my words, my words abide in you, then you will be my disciples. So this answer, this question, where do you abide? Where do you remain? Where are you going to stay around, Jesus? Um, and we want to know that so that we can go and abide there with you. We want to stay there with you. Mm-hmm. Um, that might call to mind some of the, the things Jesus said. I think this is in Matthew. He says um, to, to other disciples or other would-be disciples, um, you know, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Mm-hmm. Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. 
um, until he gets to the cross, and then he lays his head down at the cross, right? But in John's Gospel, um, this question of abiding, where Jesus remains, um, gets answered maybe mo- most forcefully uh, in chapter 14, where Jesus says, in my Father's house, that's mm-hmm. my abode, right? In my Father's house, there are many rooms, there are many mansions. Um, this, the same Greek root word is at the base of all of this stuff, um, the father's abode is the son's abode, and he's going to give his disciples a place in that abode through his abiding word. I mean, how many times can I say abiding here? Uh, but it's all being set up for us here at the beginning of the gospel um, with their answer. We, we want to know where you stick around, Jesus. Mm. Yeah, which, which again, I mean, now, do they have the, all that in mind at this point? Well, probably not. But as, as John writes this gospel, I, yeah, I think you're, you're definitely seeing how he's setting the stage for, okay, where does Jesus abide? And I appreciate you bringing out John 14 and, and his, his father's abode. I mean, because my, my mind didn't go there first. I was thinking more of the abiding in his word. You know, John chapter 8, that Reformation reading, and, and later, you know, abiding in me as a, a branch abides in the vine, and, and all of that connected to his word as well, uh, these are ways that John's gospel is going to answer this question for us as readers. Mm -hmm. And it it also goes, um, that's looking forward in the gospel of John. It also looks just a little bit back, because Mm. when John the Baptist talks about what happened at the baptism of Jesus, he says that the Spirit, I saw the Spirit descend and remain, and the word there is abide. I saw the Spirit abide on this one, Jesus. So you get this great Trinitarian package where the Spirit abides in the Son, the Son abides in the Father, and now through the words of the Son, the Spirit abides in us and brings us into the Son so that we can also be with the Father. I mean, it's all rolled up. It's all a package deal, Word and Spirit together, um, bringing us to the Father. Beautiful Trinitarian stuff. Mm. Let, let's go back just a moment to the title rabbi, which means teacher. As you, you said, they are seeking him as a teacher. And you know, in, in the context today, you know, if, if, someone, if someone came to your church and your usher asked them, you know, what are you looking for? And I said, I'm looking for Jesus to be my teacher. Uh, my initial reaction to something like that, well, okay, you, you're not quite there yet because we know that Jesus is more than a teacher. And, and, you know, certainly we live in a world in which sometimes that's all people ever want to see him as is as a teacher. And we need to speak against that. But at the same time, we don't want to lose the fact that he really is a teacher. So they're not, they're not yeah. wrong in calling him rabbi either. Yeah. These, the titles of Jesus um, and, it, and we can list out all the titles. He has many titles, um, and but maybe just before we get into the specific one here of teacher versus um, you know Christ or Messiah, uh, there is there are kind of uh, in ad, in advancement of titles that mm. disciples go through. So at first, okay, I'm going to call him Rabbi, um, but then I'm going to eventually come to the place that like by the end of the Gospel of John, you know, what's the great confession at the end? I think it's got to be Thomas saying, "My Lord and my God." Yeah. Right. So there is going to be uh, clarification for the apostles, too. But it's not like an immediate, aha, we know everything now that we've seen Jesus. Um, but just think of, of what titles do. Um, the titles that you use, they establish a, a certain kind of relationship. Right. So if um, if people come and they call you uh, Mr., uh, you know, that's that's a lot different than if they call you pastor. Right. Um, or another another good example of this is, um, you know, your your children are probably the only ones who are calling you daddy. Right. Right. But but there's a relationship there that is given by you teach your children to call you dad and to expect from you then all the things that dad means. And the the titles that we find in the Gospel of John, they help us to um to have the right I, the right framework, the right mental framework, the right categories. I don't know what, what term exactly to use there, Tim. Uh, but when Jesus comes around, the whole Old Testament has been preparing us for what to expect from him. And there's so many titles in the Old Testament that now Jesus can make use of and say, I am the Son of Man. Mm-hmm. I am the Good Shepherd. I am the King of Israel. And not just for Jesus to say that, but also for his disciples to say, oh, 
he's the lamb of God. He's the sacrifice who's going to be offered in place of, you know, the whole world for the sins of the whole world. Mm -hmm. Um, So those titles are hugely important for um, understanding who Jesus is. Yeah. They're, and they're important for answering the question that Jesus has just asked, what are you seeking? So if, if we've got the right title for Jesus, then we're going to be led down the right path of knowing what we're seeking. So he doesn't, you know, he doesn't rebuke them for, for this title rabbi, which means teacher talk, talk about what this title leads us to expect from Jesus. Yeah. The, the teaching ministry of Christ, I think if, if, uh, (laughs) you know, we're maybe more sensitive to it than than he was um, because we we don't want people to view Jesus as anything sort of less than the right. eternal Son of the Father, you know. Right, and right. you want people to to know the um, the fullness of who he is. But um, he is also the good teacher, um, and he is the one who brings light and clarity to his disciples. And so throughout the Gospel of John, we're going to see this, the teaching function of Jesus, and he has to teach correct errors, um, correct misconceptions um, in his own disciples, as well as in the world out there. Um, Around him, the other sort of Jewish expectations about what the Messiah might be like, Um, he has to bring light to those things. And so teaching is not, um, we, we shouldn't just assume that that's kind of a subpar confession. Jesus is the teacher. He is the teacher par excellence. Now, I get what you're saying. He is more than a teacher. And I think that's what um, we're sensitive to now is that people want to say, well, he was a teacher like other teachers, right? Like other great, you know, like Plato or like Aristotle or like, you know, Gandhi or, you know, fill in whoever your favorite um, teacher is. Jesus was more than that uh, because he taught the words of God um, and he is the word of God. But um, calling him teacher also does help to say, all right, he's teacher. I'm student. He's going to correct me. He's going to enlighten me. Um, and I need that. Yeah, <laughs> right? That's, that's right. a recognition there uh, that uh, that humility um, is the posture of the student and not arrogance on the posture of the teacher, but authority from the teacher. Hmm. Yeah. So this is a, a good title that they use. Rabbi, where are you staying? Where are you remaining? And, and Jesus, you know, he continues just very simply Come and you will see. So there's there's no rebuke. There's only further call here. Just join me and see. And again, I, th- I think with that that word see, that's going to be something that will come up in the next text for sure. And, and looking forward even into what happens with Thomas after the resurrection. You mentioned Thomas. You know this idea of seeing Jesus and then being blessed when you you believe without seeing. But here it is a good thing. Come and see. Jesus, this is going to be the invitation that we'll see in tomorrow's text that Philip will offer to Nathaniel, come and see. Again, very just very simple language. Uh, what a what a wonderful uh, what a wonderful introduction to Jesus, you know, this mightier one who's John's not worthy to untie his sandals. What are the first things he says? What are you looking for and come and you'll see. Yeah, and this, seeing this as the be at the very beginning of John's gospel here, then like we've mentioned in many ways, this really does open up to the rest of the gospel, right? Okay, yes, you know, if we just kind of take these seven verses out of context, we we can talk about them till the cows come home, which we're doing here, right? Uh, But think of how they function within the whole gospel account of John, um, right? It's not just that Andrew and this other disciple got to go follow Jesus, and he showed them, you know, where he was staying. This all took place in the region of Bethany, um, which is, um, you know, just to the east of Jerusalem, and and probably a little bit outside of Bethany toward the Jordan River. Um, So I'm sure Jesus took them to a specific location, but it also happens at the beginning of his earthly ministry. And so those words, come and see, for us who aren't able to follow Jesus to some specific spot. Well, where where do we get to see that? Well, keep reading, right? And through everything that you're going to read here, you're going to see the Messiah. You're going to see where Jesus remains. Mm. Well, and that's, so they, they do with Jesus, they go and see, and, and I mean, they start to do what, what they asked, right? I mean, he was stay, they saw where he was staying and they stayed with him. So this, this, 
this remaining, this abiding with Jesus is beginning already. And they, I think it's, it's worth pointing out, you know, they stayed with him that day. I think we're, we're fair to assume that, well, what were they doing? They were learning. They'd called Jesus rabbi, and so he began to teach. They began to learn that even though we don't have all of the dialogue recorded, this remaining with Jesus has begun. He begins to give them his word so that they might see who he is. Yeah, absolutely. And they um, again, that just provides a little bit of that backdrop for when he calls them later. You know, this is kind of a, a semi-permanent arrangement, not even semi-permanent arrangement. It's just one day. Right. right. Come and come and, you know, le- let me teach you a, a quick lesson. Let me give you the introduction to the whole course. And it's going to be later on the Sea of Galilee where he's going to say to these same to these same men, come follow me. And this time, leave everything behind. Mm. Not just for a day, not just for a week, but come follow me for the rest of your life. Mm. So, so this account in John chapter one is is probably not to be understood as their call to be the apostle of of Christ, one of the twelve. Not quite at this point. I mean, obviously Jesus knows that that's coming, but Matthew four, what Luke five, I think that would be the the call to be an apostle by the Sea of Galilee. Yeah, the, these things come right. Don't set them in opposition to each other, right? right? It's not like um, it's it's all they're all pieces to the puzzle. So John doesn't record later. John doesn't need to record that there was a moment where Jesus said, "Come, follow me," um, because it began here. Um, and so you don't need to have those later, um, you know, Jesus clinching them or advancing them. Um, I hate to use the word graduation, but it's kind of like right. Uh, there is a progress. There is a, a, a progression for the apostles themselves. And, you know, it's it's hard not to compare it to our own kind of seminary formation, right, Tim? Mm-hmm. But there is a process that you go through as you discern, um, you know, your your vocation, your calling to be a pastor. And it, it I think it's helpful to see um, it doesn't just, it's not like one day they woke up and said, man, I want to be an apostle. It, it happened in stages a little more mm. gradually. So we've got two of them here in this text. And as we, we mentioned, one remains unnamed, very likely the apostle John, the author of this gospel, though he is not named here. The other though is named very clearly and it's Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, you know, when we think about who are the 12 disciples, if you have to list them, normally we list Peter, James, and John first. Most people can probably also name Judas Iscariot. Andrew then wouldn't get mentioned until fifth place at the earliest, if you if you follow <laughs> the most famous of the disciples, at least today. But he's yeah. the first one named here by by John the Apostle. I mean, he so he he's going to play a bit larger of a role in this gospel. Yeah, it's interesting to. Um, of course, when you read the gospels, the the central figure is Jesus, right? Of course, right? Um, but you do get kind of a different cast of characters around him in John's gospel than you do in the synoptics. So in the synoptics, it's always Peter. Well, it's just Peter, right? Yeah. Um, Peter is the spokesman for the apostles. He's the one who gives the great confession. He's the one who gets the new name. I, thou art Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church, right? Most famously. Uh, but in John's gospel, it's, it's the other it's, it's others of the 12. So it's Andrew. It's going to be Philip. It's going to be Nathaniel um, who, who get mentioned. Um, even the other Judas um, gets mentioned in here. Um, so it, you almost get this sense, or, or you get a little bit of a picture. And, and, you know, how much do we want to read into this? I don't know. You could probably get carried away. But I think it is interesting to just see that within the 12, there may have been different you know, in any group of 12 men, you're going to have different, there's going to be a hierarchy that develops, right. first of all, and there's going to be different kind of um, groups that just sort of naturally form and take shape. And so maybe, I don't know, maybe this is speculation, Tim, but maybe Andrew and John are a little, even though Andrew is Peter's brother, for whatever reason, maybe Andrew gravitates a little more towards John. And so when John is recounting his gospel, Andrew is going to come up more frequently. Okay. All right. Yeah. Then that that very well may be. We have so we have Andrew as the first of Jesus' disciples who are going to be mentioned in this gospel, and he's then introduced as Simon Peter's brother, which advances 
the narrative. That's what Andrew does is he goes and finds his brother, Simon, and says, hey, look, we have found, and now he doesn't say we have found a great rabbi, a great teacher, but we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Now, I think this probably requires a little bit more explanation because both Messiah and Christ are, are words that we may not know what they mean in English. So, so what what is what is Andrew telling his brother here? Yeah, well, I think um, I hadn't thought of this before, Tim. But don't wouldn't it make sense that if they called him Rabbi before, and now Andrew calls him Messiah? it's probably likely there's a hint at what they talked about that night. Yeah, that's right. You know, Jesus is saying, hey, guys, I'm actually the Messiah. <laughs> it's okay for you to call me Messiah. You can call right. me Christ. Um, so the Christ means, uh, Messiah and Christ, are they're the same word, just in different languages, right? So Messiah is Hebrew or maybe Aramaic. Um, Christ is Greek. And they mean the same thing. They mean one who is anointed. So you have different little C Christs in the Old Testament. The kings are anointed. Um, the priests are anointed. They would both be, uh, you could call either of them Christs. They're Christ figures. Um, but any anyone who would get anointed would be, uh, you know, Christed or, or christened, I suppose we might say in English. So the Greek, the Greek translation of Messiah is just Christos, Christ. Mm. But it also is a, a title that there was the, always the sense in the Old Testament that what we're looking for, what we're hoping for, is not just another um, high priest like Aaron, not just another um, David figure, but something more. And the prophets clarify that, right? The prophets, throughout their their writing and their preaching, they are building this crystal, this Christ-centered focus of the Old Testament. And so when Jesus comes around, here's the title that's going to be applied to him by his first disciples. Hey, we, you know, we've always been talking about the Messiah. We've been talking about the Christ. We found him mm. at last. The one who we hoped for has appeared. Come on, let's go, Peter. Or I guess he wouldn't have called him Peter. What He would have called him Simon. Simon. Come on, brother. Let's go. Yeah, that's right. And this this is something that we'll see in the next text too. There is this excitement upon you know learning that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, such that not only are they excited of what they've found for themselves, but they want to tell others about it too. You see Andrew bringing his own brother. Tomorrow we'll see Philip bringing Nathaniel as well. That that this news that's being it's been proclaimed by John in part and now more fully in Jesus. There's this desire to to share it with the other ones who are waiting for the Christ. Look, he's here. He's here. And so Andrew brings his brother to Jesus. We don't get any interaction on from the side of, of Simon Peter at this point, but we do have something that Jesus says to him. And we've been talking about titles, the titles or the names maybe for Jesus. Here, Jesus does something with Simon's name. He says, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. And again, we have two names. You know, one of them means Peter. Probably it requires a little bit more explanation. What's going on here with Jesus renaming of Simon? Yeah, the... Um he <laughs> it's hard not to hear this and just think of like maybe the modern tendency to give people nicknames yeah um but i i think we want to see something more than that it's not just that jesus was the kind of guy who gave nicknames although maybe he was um i think what sh what we should see what we should sense is that he's doing something that's been done before um so god renames abraham he names him from Abram to Abraham. He gives him a new name, and that giving of a name comes with a new calling or a new, there's going to be a new function for Abraham, right? Not just a, a mighty father, but the father of many nations. Um, and this really goes back even before that. You can think of Adam in the garden. You know, Adam created on the sixth day to be in God's image and to share in his authority. What's the first thing that, that Adam does in the garden? Well, he names the animals. Hmm. And by naming them, he is um, he is showing his authority over the animals. He is assigning um, who they are or what they are 
to them. Um, it's an exercise of authority is my point here. And so with Jesus, you know, his disciples come to him. He, in a sense, he owns them. They belong to him, we might say. Mm -hmm. And so he assigns names to them. He gives them names. And so it's a show of his um, authority. He is the new um, Adam, we might say. He's doing what Adam had done with the animals and even what Adam did with Eve, right? Adam named the woman Eve. Um, so Jesus now does that with his own disciples. He gives them names. And uh, the name, of course, Peter means the rock. Mm -hmm. Cephas is just the same. It's um, kind of like Messiah and Christ, same word in two different languages. So Cephas is Aramaic and Peter Petros is is Greek. And but what's interesting is that here in John, Jesus gives this name quite apart from anything Peter has done. Yeah. Um, in, in Matthew's gospel, which is the more well-known account of the naming of Peter, uh, it comes after Peter's great confession, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responds and says, truly flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I say from now on, I don't know if he says from now on, but I've always just taken it that way. Thou art Peter. Mm. Well, apparently Jesus had already been calling Peter, Peter. And he'd already called Simon Peter. Um, and, you know, I, I think that that actually makes a lot of sense, that Jesus had called him this from the beginning. But then after his great confession, it's like, oh, that's why you called me that. Right. That's that's what this was all about. Right. Was that it's it's the confession that you are the Christ. Um, and here, you know, what is what does John's gospel add to it? Well, it shows us that um, the name Jesus gave at the beginning of of his um, you know, his relationship with with Peter, Jesus already gave the name, which then, you know, later is going to um, come to fruition when Peter makes that great confession. And then Pete, Jesus can sort of re-stamp him at that mm -hmm. point and say, yeah, that's right, Peter. See, I always called you Peter. This is why, because <laughs> you were going to make this confession. Mm, that's right. But with just about a minute here, Pastor Apple, tell us to wrap things up on the morning. It's a fantastic text. Uh, give us give us a quick summary here to wrap things up. Oh, yeah, it's such a great um, text at the beginning of John's Gospel, but also it's it's a beautiful epiphany text for us, right? That um, the Christ who was born in a stable and no one knew it, um, now he's going to be made manifest. And part of that being made manifest, being made known, is that his disciples are drawn to him, right? They come to his light, and in in that light, they find their life. Um, they find a new purpose, a new calling. Um, they find new life. And he, he does the same thing for his church still, right? The function of this text um, continues to take place in the church. He names us. He christens us. Um, he brings us in. And then, just like Andrew, we go out and we say, we've found what we've been looking for. And even if you weren't looking for this, you should be, right? Mm -hmm. Because what is what Jesus comes to do, he doesn't just come to fulfill the Old Testament for the Jews, right? He is the, the, the fulfillment of their hope, but he is also the fulfillment of the hope of every, every person um, that, that God wants to come and be their God, to be known by every single human uh, who he has created. Pastor David Appold is pastor at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Paducah, Kentucky, helping us today to study John chapter 1, verses 35 to 42. Pastor Appold, thanks for being our guest today. Yes, thanks for having me, Tim. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about John chapter 1 or any of the gospel according to St. John, please send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a pleasure to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.